Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Channel 781 News special report. I'm excited that today we have our first ever interview with a seated elected official. Um, it's someone very appropriate because we've talked about his work a lot on our shows. I am here with Ward 9 City Councilor Jonathan Paz. Hello. Thanks for having me, Josh. And it's great to be here with you both. Thanks a lot for coming on. We really appreciate it. And I'm also here with my Channel 781 co-host, Emily Sapiria. Hello. So uh, just to clarify what I just said, we had Christine Mackin on right after she left office. We had Councillor Bradley MacArthur on just before she took office. So now uh, Councillor Paz is officially our first sitting elected official. So big day for us in Channel 781 News. Um, so Jonathan passes in his second term as Waltham City Councilor for Ward 9. In 2019, he beat out long-serving Councilor Robert Logan for that seat. He was 26 at the time, which makes him, we think, the second youngest ever city councilor. Uh, one way that he stands out on the council is instead of just responding to issues that are specific to his ward, he organizes people around issues also that are uh, important to the whole city or to the whole state. And in fact, recently he was organizing protests against the signature collecting for what's now question four on this year's ballot and was sued by the Republican Party for doing that. Um, so we'll ask him about question four and a bunch of other issues um, that we know are important to him here in Waltham. So I'm going to hand it off to Emily. So thanks again, Councillor Paz. Um, so tell me a little bit, how did you get involved with question four? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having me again. Um, question four, I mean, I feel like I, I kind of grew up into it, right? Um, I grew up in Waltham as the son of undocumented Bolivian immigrants. So, um, you know, my family, driving down the street uh, without a driver's license was something that was very personal and dear uh, to my heart. Um, so I've been involved in the push for the Work and Family Mobility Act. Um, I think going into five years now that I've advocated for it uh, in my own personal time. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's been a 16 year movement process. Um, and the Work and Family Mobility Act is really an opportunity to give everyone who has, uh, who can uh, and, and wants to get on the road, uh, regardless of their immigration status, an opportunity to get trained, tested, and insured. So then when we know that they're on the streets, they're going to be just as well registered, trained, uh, and insured as anyone else on the road. Um, so the Work and Family Mobility Act has been something that I know personally, and I know across the Waltham community that can benefit a lot of our working families because people just want to be able to get to their grocery store. They want to be able to get to their, drop off their kids to the school, go to work without having fear of being pulled over and not having the necessary documents um, to show that um, they know what they're doing on the road, right? Uh, so it's it's been a long time process um, and <laughs> it wouldn't be Massachusetts if we didn't have a referendum about it, right? So we're gonna go now into um, election day and Massachusetts voters will decide if they want to uh, repeal or keep the Work and Family Mobility Act. So yes on four means that we're gonna keep the law that we passed with a super majority in the state house, uh, bipartisan um, effort, um, and a no would repeal it. So it's been a long time coming, but it's really just a common sense law that even our local law enforcement is behind. I mean, our chief of police, our local DA, our sheriff. So it's just common sense. It keeps our roads safer. Um, and it's, if it isn't clear or obvious, it's very near and dear my heart. Fantastic, really appreciate that. Um, and so one thing I've been curious about, but haven't been able to find information about is that question four, doesn't appear on the voter information packet. Do you have any insight as to um, why that happened or um, what anybody can do if they're seeking more information about question four beyond tuning into their local news? Yeah, absolutely. And this is why I'm part of why I'm here in the show. Um, it's that it's really flying under the radar. Um, but the short of it is that uh, it got registered as a ballot question very last minute in September, I believe like mid-September. So it it missed um, the printing and the distribution that all the other 
ballot questions had. So it's on the ballot. It's going to be on for election day. Um, but uh, I can tell you a long story about a very long summer. <laughs> Not sure if you want me to share that one. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, please share if you've got a great I'd story. I'd like to hear more about yeah, hear that work. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's I think a it's a very telling story. I'll just say it like that. Um, so we pass, we make history in the state house, Massachusetts state house. We make history um, in July where um, we we not only passed the Working Family Mobility Act, but we passed it twice <laughs> because as soon as it passed, the governor vetoed it. Uh, we knew he was going to veto it. Um, and then we had such overwhelming support in both uh, with state reps and senators that it was passed again um, over while overriding the governor's veto. And we did not have one week to celebrate. We did not have one week, not seven days passed by, six days and a few hours passed by. And um, the leadership in the Massachusetts Republican Party went around pushing for um, gathering signature effort, which is completely um you know, within the scope of the law, they have a right to try to repeal something. Um, but they went around, they invested this entire summer um, gathering signatures, misinforming people, lying to people, fear mongering, using all these xenophobic and racist slurs that we know, that we've known for decades, right? Um, so they they got enough, they needed uh, 40,000 plus, like they needed over 40,000 signatures. Um, and they were successful in gathering signatures, but, you know, some of us felt that they were misinforming people and, you know, if they have a right to use the First Amendment and say some terrible things, we have the right to have a public debate about it and say that those things are pretty racist and misinforming and terrible. Um, so there was a, a there was an effort to essentially have a broader dialogue because they were going around grocery stores, um, I don't know, gun shops. Um, and all these other places essentially gathering signatures, lying to people about what this was about and getting those signatures. Um, so it was a concerted effort um, to, in my view, play political football with the lives and the safety of Massachusetts taxpayers. Um, and they know it's a gubernatorial year, like these things are not a coincidence, they're, they're very much uh, in sync. So. Uh, it was very frustrating to see that they got enough signatures, but even more so because, again, they're toying with the lives of other people. So it sounds like there's now a very limited window of time to get out the information um, that indeed that this is on the ballot, this referendum is on the ballot, um, and that the ask is um, for people to vote yes on it. Um, how can people um, assist in that effort? Um, are there ways to help with, yet, with your initiative? Yeah, I mean, so this is uh, a little bit outside my work in the city council. Uh, in my own personal life, um, you know, I, I feel very passionate about this as any other person does. Um, and I'm having, I've had uh, Tuesday canvases, phone banking, you know, it's a tall order to run a ballot campaign with like, let's say six weeks, maybe just under two months worth of time to get out, to get out the word, make sure people know what's at stake, making sure that people really understand this because there's a lot of misinformation flying around. But yeah, I mean, if people want to get involved, they can definitely reach out to me. Um, and we're having, um, we're even going to partner with some Brandeis students who want to get out the word. Uh, we worked with already some local leaders, amazing group of Latina mothers who have been phone banking out of my out of my dining room. Um, but you know, we're trying to get the word out. We're gonna we're trying to get people to really be activated and engaged on this issue because uh, for too long people have been asking for this. You can walk down the street and talk to your local barber, your grocery store worker who may be an immigrant without status, they will tell you they need a license. <laughs> um, so it's it's just such an important issue and uh, I'm more than happy to get more people involved, but we are seeing yes on four for safer roads. When you were talking about the misinformation campaign around question four, when they were here on Waltham, we heard them telling people that the most important reason for this is because if, if undocumented immigrants can apply for a driver's license, that means they can also vote which is false. 
And this isn't just something uh, that we heard because I just saw actually before we got on the interview on Facebook two days ago, Jim Lyons, the chair of the Republican Party, posted the exact same thing on Facebook. So they've turned this into a thing where it's not a clash of opinions. It's a clash of facts. It's a disagreement on facts. And that's kind of like a disturbing trend, you know, in politics. And so in addition to all the other reasons, <laughs> to vote yes on this. I think it's important to vote yes on this to push back on the fact that they're really blatantly and opening, openly using false facts to try to push this. Yeah, and, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so important to dispel that. Uh, everywhere we go, we need to dispel that because they do not have anything to do with each other. The Secretary of State came out even speaking, you know, correcting the governor <laughs> of Massachusetts, telling him, hey, we have two different tracks here um, because there are other people who can't vote but have access to license to, to a driver's license in Massachusetts. We have the existing infrastructure. We have the existing regulations to make sure that um, those two things aren't confused. Uh, so it, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, without naming names, um, some people that are very cynical in this state in this state and in this country uh don't have anything of value politically to provide so they have to resort to these xenophobic racist just they're just such tired stereotypes um and they're so easy to dispel so i just hope that the good people of waltham the good people of massachusetts understand that this is about keeping our roads safer. It has nothing to do with the border. <laughs> it's a state matter. We don't control the federal federal laws. This is everything to do with people just being insured, tested, and, and, and registered um, drivers. So then we're all a little bit safer. We're all a little bit more aware of who's on the road. And, and yeah, it's just so important to, to humanize this issue, but just to understand how practical it is. Um, so I really appreciate that, Josh, because, you know, there are there's misinformation everywhere, but we can't let that permeate at least the Waltham level of understanding. Great. Thank you so much for providing more background and information on that important question. Um, another important question that we'd love to ask you about um, our important topic is um, housing in Waltham. Um, we've had um, now two master input meetings and it's become clear if it wasn't clear to anyone already that housing is a top priority on a lot of people's minds in Waltham. Um, and it's something that you've been doing some work on um, you know, since you've been in office. Um, so I was wondering if you had some insight as to what is um, you know, the top or, you know, top few barriers to creating more housing in Waltham in your mind? So one of the reasons why I ran, right? I'm, I'm, the, I'm still the only renter in the city council. Um, I'm the only guy that um, in the city council that has the honor of paying rent. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to share that I ran back in 2019 because I felt that um, a lot of good people in Waltham, a lot of Waltham locals are being pushed out. Um, some of these things are part of a broader housing market. You know, where there's a there's a there's a market effect in Massachusetts. There's a federal housing market across the country, but in Waltham, a lot of people are struggling to pay for rent. And this was before COVID, um, and in part has a lot to do with how these massive developments uh, in Waltham and how some of them took place. Um, really defined uh, a lot of people's experiences as they moved into Waltham and as they struggled to stay here. Uh, I remember the largest fire in Waltham history happened in my district. And at the time, um, this was supposed to be this like transit oriented housing, um, you know, state of the art thing that was going to happen. And a lot of people in the neighborhood were already skeptical about it. And on top of that, it, it, I don't know what happened. It was arson. Something set it on fire. And you see all these concerns just materialize in one example where the river got polluted, where neighborhoods had to suffer through pollution. Um, but on top of that, um, if you look at the rates, you know, between these luxury uh, apartments and the apartments that surround it in, the, in that in that district side of the city, it's such a stark contrast. Um, and I and I don't have the time 
but to explain this, but you can tell that there has been a steady increase because it has that residual impact. You know, if you're a landlord in one side of the city and you're hearing that these apartments are going for an exorbitantly amount more, you're going to be incentivized to increase your rent. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not just about, you know, how do we create more affordable housing, right? It's how do we define affordable and also how do we preserve what's affordable and what's dignified? Um, because if you're throwing people in a closet and it's cheap, that isn't exactly dignity, right? Um, so, you know, I think the ways to think about this, um, I think about this too much, but I think the ways to think about this is, you know, what are things that are out of our control and what are things that are within our control? And what has past research and work uh, within the city and outside the city, how can that inform our work within Waltham? Um, and I just wanna say that in a very practical way, we've had developers really set the tone for the conversations we have around housing. Um, and it's really important that, you know, the good people of Waltham take back that conversation and really drive the narrative. This is the kind of housing that we want, where we want it, um, and think through, you know, if we are going to be paying rent and asking people to pay rent, who is that really going to benefit? Um, is it going to be a nonprofit developer? Is it going to be a for-profit developer that's going to flip it? And then one day you just never know. Um, so it's, it's those type of things that we need to really center the conversation is who's dictating the terms of the conversation, who's setting the rent. And I think third is how are we in a way working with the opportunities statewide, federally to not make this, um, uh, not make housing an impossible feat. Um, because, you know, we are in a way just suffering through the consequences of federal inaction. Um, or statewide in action, right? So it's not all on the Waltham City Council or the mayor to figure out. I'm just going to like, qualify everything that I'm saying. It's, you know, there is a lot of uh, federal things that could have happened a long time ago that did not happen. So what the city has to do is respond and survive. And in terms of what um, the city, what the municipality can do, um, you know, there were some, you know, really great ideas that came up during these recent master input meetings, um, people talking about, um, you know, zoning, um, looking at um, duplexes and triplexes and where they are allowed, where they aren't allowed, things like accessory dwelling units. Um, based on your knowledge um, or um, your insight, do you think that efforts like those could have a significant impact on our housing needs? Um, are those avenues that we should pursue as neighboring communities have? Yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've only seen so many um, potential housing developments in my time. Um, but I think that there are some that people were very excited about and there were some that people were very nervous about. Um, I think the zoning is a major piece of it because, you know, a few decades ago, I mean, some towns and cities in Massachusetts don't have inclusionary zoning um, and Waltham does. And we even went a step further to amend our inclusionary zoning. Um, a short way to define inclusionary zoning is if you're going to build a complex with more than 15 units, we can dictate to say X percentage has to go, has to be rented at an affordable rate. And in Waltham, we recently increased that to 20%. Now, that's something within our toolbox. We have a lot of things in our toolbox. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly worried about some of that zoning by the way that we define affordable. You know, I think the economy has changed such that an 80% AMI may be a little bit inflated. Um, the data may not exactly reflect reality because, again, we struggle to collect a lot of good data. Um, just real just, quick, can you explain yeah. what AMI is for those oh, who sorry. don't know? <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Um, so when we define affordable, AMI means area medium income. So it's how we define a working family. You know, it's like, what income do they have? Um, which in my mind is a little bit too one dimensional or two dimensional, if you will. But, um, you know, I, I was proposed, I proposed before that we should probably define affordable at a rate that's pretty much well known as affordable, which in my mind is 50%. We can assume you can pay the rent of a person who makes $80,000 or $100,000. Uh, 
Um, but the reality is such that it's harder to understand really like people's incomes, people's wealth, people's expenses, healthcare in this country is very difficult. So, you know, the more that we're able to lower that threshold, the more we're able to actually be accessible. Because again, uh, I can make 80, 90, $100,000 a year, but there may be other realities behind that income, right? And people pay taxes too, right? So you're never making what you're saying you're making. So if we keep raising that and calling that affordable, we're assuming a lot of out of people, right? Um, so the reality is, again, I, I can go on and on, but the reality is a lot of people, not just in wealth, they're my rent burdened, where the, where the rent cost eats up 30%, 50% of your income. So if that's 30 to 50% of your income, how are you going to feed your kids? How are you ever going to go on vacation? How are you ever going to respond to a crisis, mm -hmm. right? So we do have these tools in the city council where we can dictate some of this zoning, where we can define some of these things, right? Um, I, I don't think that we have, a, I think we have a city council that understands it's an issue. Um, I think some people understand it, that it's it's a very big, maybe amorphous issue. But I think we need to be more aggressive at not only defining what's affordable housing, but I think being more aggressive and planning for it. You know, what are, what's our plan three to five to 10 years? That's why I'm so excited we're doing this master plan. Uh, we're, we're getting input across the city for what people need, what people want. Um, and hopefully we have a plan when it comes to housing, because it's not enough to say, hey, campaign promise, here's my check mark. I care about this. It's more important that we plan for the future as if it's a dire need. Because again, I can go with my day without having a Starbucks matcha latte, which I love, but I cannot ignore the realities of having shelter over my head, right? So we, we need to understand that it's it's not a want, it's a need and an urgent need at that. But again, as the only renter in the city council, uh, it's difficult sometimes to convey these things because um, I don't know, some people may be removed from it, you know, and and it's understandable. It may seem like a theoretical concept at that. Absolutely. Now, um, can you remind us, is there any legislation um, that you've been working on in the city council around um, tenants or housing? And do you have any updates on the status of that le legislation? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am pushing for the notification uh, rights ordinance. Um, I think a, a short, um, in short, it's essentially making sure that in, in the situation where, let's say, a landlord is asking their tenant to quit, meaning that it's, it's an eviction process, at the start of it, we need to make sure that those tenants know that there are resources to them and they need to know their rights. So the ordinance, it's actually very short and sweet, just says, hey, if you're going to go through this eviction process, just make sure that you're providing this piece of paper that provides that resources and those rights. And the ordinance is flexible such that it can be the city defining it in partnership with another city organization, right? Because the city doesn't do everything housing, but we, we do have partners that we work with, we rely on, and they rely on us. So I, I think it's a common sense ordinance. It's in my mind, scratching the surface as to what we can do to preserve uh, housing and really preserve communities, right? We wanna preserve the community here and not have unnecessary evictions. Um, and, I, and I just wanna share a quick story again, feel, interrupt me if I'm going for too long, but a summer ago, I think it was a summer ago, two summers ago, because time is, is flying. I had a call from a resident who was, you know, very urgently calling me. And, and I was like, why is he calling me three, five times in a row? Because I couldn't answer the phone. But you know, when it's that, it's serious. <laughs> if someone's calling you those many times, it's serious. And I finally answer and I was like, hey man, what's going on? And he's like, counselor, my landlord's harassing me. He won't stop following my car. And I'm like, I'm gonna give you my address and we're gonna call the police if he gets here because he's harassing me. Right. So he gets to my house. Um, he 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 said that the guy stopped tailing him and we file a police report 
And, you know, we basically tell them that, um, you know, this, this landlord's doing this and that. And he, the landlord was saying that he owed him money that he didn't owe him. Um, but, you know, the guy was really worried for his safety. He was worried about um, how can this impact him in the future? So that's like a terrible example, like an extreme example. But I've witnessed it <laughs> to that extent, right? Where there are people abusing that power, where there are people who... I think know that some people are in a tough position, so they want to like maybe squeeze something out of them or maybe get rid of them rather than go through a legal process. So that is an extreme example, but that happened in my <laughs> in front of my house, you know. Um, so it's it's hard to say that this isn't this is like indicative of one part of the city or not. I just think there's a lot of tenants across the city that have expressed some desire to a know where the resources are. If only I knew I could have gotten rent from the city, right? Because we were given out rental assistance at some point, right? I've heard that a lot more times. If only I knew that I had this right or that my, my landlord couldn't talk to me this way. And then I've heard on the similar coin, landlord saying, if only I knew what resources to point my tenant to, I don't want to have to go through this process. If only they knew, right? So it, it is a win-win when everyone's operating with good information. And when we have those parameters, we have those laws in place to make sure that um, people can have a dignified process if they do have to leave. We started with a resolution to talk about homeowners, landlords, and tenants. Um, we, we wanted to have a conversation around displacement. Um, so we got data from people who were not only evicted, but foreclosed across the city. Um, I don't have the numbers with me because I'm still moving into my new apartment, but um, I was pretty surprised how widespread um, foreclosures were across the city uh, and evictions. Like the data was pretty um, distributed across. Um, but, you know, we, we did extensive work on displacement, understanding how COVID impacted um, people's livelihoods in the city. And we realized in the Community and Economic Development uh, Committee that we needed an ordinance to at least address it from this perspective where we can impact it the most. Uh, so we are moving it to rules and ordinances. Uh, and I just introduced the ordinance at rules and ordinances committee uh, and we'll have hopefully a healthy uh, and extensive debate about it. Um, but my hope is that we move forward with this and make sure that at very least we're notifying people of resources uh, and their rights and doing it across the city in a way that we can be proud of. Absolutely. Josh, do you have any follow-up questions? Yeah, you had mentioned working with nonprofit developers, and that made me think of a specific project that was in your war during your time, which was the armory idea. And we actually asked Christine Mackin about it when, um, recently, because even though it happened before our show was on the air, we think it's a good example to look at to understand how housing works or doesn't work. Um, so that was a situation where someone wanted to turn the old abandoned armory building into affordable housing and it kind of died in the city council. It seemed like a popular project, but it didn't work out and it would, could be kind of hard to tell from the public why it didn't work out. So can you tell us more about um, the armory and, and what we could learn from that project um, in terms of working with developers and particularly nonprofit developers? Yeah, I mean, I, the armory was something that I was very excited with, I was excited about. It was an effort from Watch CDC and a different CDC that we're going to repurpose the armory um, at a great affordable rates. Um, and they were working around things to make sure the parking wasn't going to be an issue. Um, but it, it's a tough, it's a tough example because it's one of those things where every stakeholder was on the same page minus the owner you know and it, it became i was a learning opportunity for me because at the time you know in in the in the <laughs> to be really fair um i was missing this information that uh there wasn't a purchase and sale agreement and that we started this whole process without a real commitment from the owner to say hey we're i'm gonna sell this a and b i am going to sell it at this price um, which is what you need to start any real housing project is you need a PNS like you need because then, you know, if you don't have a purchase and sale agreement, someone could say, hey, I'll sell you my house. And then you start this whole process and they say a million and then they change their mind and they say seven million. Right. Um, so 
you know, it, it was really disappointing because it was a very, I have a diplomatic word for it, but I don't remember the word. Capricious. Yes, capricious. Yes, it was a capricious owner. And it's disappointing, but I, I mean, I think people can maybe change their mind eventually. Um, but it, we just couldn't get an agreement, a purchase and sale agreement, and it, it didn't happen. But it would have been a phenomenal example of what community-led affordable housing can look like, because the majority of the community around it said, we don't want a rotting piece of armory <laughs> in our backyard. We want to see something that's good and thriving. Um, and there was extensive surveys done, and a lot of people were very happy about the idea. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so another of the issues that was really at the forefront of people's minds at these recent master input meetings is bikes. Um, and it seems like, you know, regardless of anyone's stripe, people are thinking about bikes. Um, so that's, um, you've been working on a bike share resolution and, um, recently, or you'd put a bike share resolution forward recently, um, I saw that you asked for an update from the planning committee. So I was wondering if you could first um, tell us about that bike share resolution uh, for those um, who hadn't heard about it or want to hear more about it. And then also tell us if you've had that update yet. Yeah, so uh, bike shares are an incredible way to um, not only incentivize people to ride more bikes, uh, but also to do them in a way that can um, really embrace the transient like life of being next to Boston, right? We're part of the greater Boston community. We're not just Waltham. Um, so blue bikes are a ride share system. You basically uh, make an account. There's a dock. You grab one of the bikes and you can drop it off at any of their stations. So you can take it from Waltham to Boston or just to Watertown. Um, and it's a great system. It's, it's uh, I think, a, a point of pride for Boston because those blue bikes are literally everywhere. Um, and we have a great opportunity to, to be a part of that network. Uh, Watertown has already done it. Newton has already done it. A great question is why hasn't Waltham done it? Uh, so we, we've had very exciting conversations with the uh, director of planning. She's very passionate. Um, Catherine Cagle, she's very passionate about making sure this is part of uh, our, our, our transit system in the city. And she has worked, she is working with Blue Bikes. We had them come on to committee um, and they shared that basically the city would cover the cost of the docks, um, but they would cover the maintenance, which is, I think, a pretty fair deal. Um, and we were thinking around um, partnering with the universities because a lot of the uh, a lot of students will want in on this system and and we really need to map out what are going to be those points uh, that we want to prioritize um, not only assuming but understanding where do people really come and go so um, there is some work going on to not only map out where those points are going to be but also where the money's coming from so I'm assuming going into um, this tomorrow's meeting, um, you know, we're going to hear a little bit more about um, the legal, the legalese, if you will, um, in this type of partnership, and also what it would mean if and when we do identify certain locations, what it would mean legally for us to kind of put, because it's again, it's a public-private partnership, so there's a lot of laws around public-private partnerships to do. To, to figure out, you know, how do we figure this out in a way that complies with all the regulations? But, you know, my, my question is always, how do we get it done in the fastest way possible so then we can start um, fixing it where we need to, right? Because we're going to make a lot of assumptions and we're going to have to come back to the drawing board in case some things aren't working. But it's very exciting to see that the South Side gets it. People from the south side want <laughs> they they want uh, bike friendly infrastructure and they want to make sure that they can do it safely. Can you tell us any more uh, about Blue Bikes as a company? Um, any more about um, the experience in neighboring municipalities? Um, what drew you to this project? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, um I think this is one of those like very practical solutions that hits a lot of. Um, intersecting issues, right? Um, 
there's we need to get cars off the roads and still answer to the needs of people who need to move around um because traffic's getting terrible um you know we're always kind of playing catch up when it comes to fixing streets um but we we have been working on the uh uh the way trail which is like a east to west transportation um and we need to that we have this opportunity to start getting people off their cars, riding bikes, but also maybe creating it in a way that goes north to south. Um, so that's so I'm hand, I'm trying to push for the piece where we get more bikes on the road, um, bikes through the parks. I think it be it will be really really important that we start using less carbon intensive mechanisms to transport ourselves, but also making sure that it's accessible because bikes these days aren't exactly cheap and maintaining them is not exactly cheap. Um, and also it's helpful for the youth to get around, right? So we're hitting a few of these things around access and uh, decarbonizing transportation, right? But we also need this other side of the conversation about the, um, the roads. Like how do we make sure our roads are safe and are, you know, we, we end this divide between North and South Waltham, right? Not a social divide per se, right? But it's an infrastructure divide. Uh, yeah. One can say socioeconomic too, but East to West, we seem to have figured out, but we need to figure out North to South. Um, people on the South side want to go um, to the high school or want to go to the farm. And then people on the North side want to come hang out in Woody Street because we're the more fun side of the city, right? <laughs> So <laughs> and that part, I think Councillor Darcy is really spearheading. And I hope that we really take that on in a very serious way, because um, the north to south conversation around Lexington Street, having its own independent bike lane and having, um, you know, some safety parameters behind it, I, I really think is is dire. You can't have one without the other because we don't want to just have bikes that don't have the safe uh, infrastructure around it, right? So uh, it's very exciting, I think, to start leveling up these conversations, and they're becoming a lot more mainstream, and I think for the right reasons. And we've got so much to look forward to in our upcoming municipal year. Um, we've got an election next year for mayor and city council. Um, I think there's a lot of questions in our grouchy minds, but also beyond. Um, so far, one thing we know in terms of the races is that Mayor McCarthy is running for re-election. Um, beyond that, do you have any predictions about the races, mayoral, city council, um, any thoughts that you'd like to put out there as people start thinking about um, gearing up for a season that I think that I think will come qu much more quickly than we anticipate. Yeah, and time flies, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very exciting to see a lot more people, maybe through COVID, maybe through other reasons across the country, people are getting involved with local government. So I, I don't know, I can anticipate some very healthy competition, I think, at every level, um, from school committee to city council. Uh, I'm not sure about other candidates for mayor, but it wouldn't surprise me if other people decided to um, take a leap for it. Um, but I, I, I'm very much encouraged um, by the level of participation I've seen. I've seen all across, uh, from you know parent groups to just people asking questions directly at these public input meetings. Um, there's a healthy, I think, level of democracy happening in Waltham. So I think next year we'll continue that trend. Um, but yeah, it's very exciting. Fantastic. Well, we want to be mindful of your time, but if you'd, if you'd, if you'd be interested, we would love to have you back again sometime. Would you be interested in coming back and speaking with us again? Oh, absolutely. Come on. Wonderful. Say... <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. This has been interesting, especially the, the parts about housing. That's, I thought that was really helpful background. Yeah. And I just want to thank you, uh, you know, 781 uh, channel for doing the, the work that you're, you're all doing. Uh, we all benefit from more journalism, from more, I think, local media. I think that's uh, asking good questions. I think trying to provide good information. It's very important and necessary uh, in this very polarized world. Uh, keeping it local uh, into the issues, which you guys have all been doing, I think is great. Thank well, you. Thank you so much, Councillor Puzz, and thank you for your time again. And Thanks please come back again. <laughs> Take care.